Hey everyone and welcome to the channel. So for today's video, we are going to go over a buyer's guide for the all new fourth generation Mitsubishi Outlander. This SUV here is considered a compact three row SUV. So if you are in the market for a three row vehicle, but you don't want something that is super large, you want access to the third row, but you still want a small SUV. I think this is the only vehicle in its class currently available. So we are going to go over all of the years, all of the trim levels, all of the engine options for this compact three row SUV. So that way you can get a better idea for this vehicle if this is something you are looking to purchase. Now I also did a full detailed review on the exact Outlander behind me. So if you wanna see all the details on this exact plug-in hybrid, definitely take a look at that separate video. So let's talk a little bit about the history for the Mitsubishi Outlander. Like I mentioned earlier, this is the fourth generation. Mitsubishi introduced the Outlander back in 2004. They went through a lot of design element changes, a lot of technology for the interior, a lot of changes in general over the years, bringing us to the fourth generation, which was introduced in 2022. Now, Mitsubishi also introduced a hybrid version for the Outlander in 2013. So it's been 11 years since that technology has been vastly improved. And in this fourth generation, the model behind us is a plug-in hybrid. So I'm sure back then the hybrid system was much different. I am very impressed with this model behind me. There's also a lot of different trim levels that you can get with the Outlander in general. So we'll start off with the trim levels that are available for the non-plug-in hybrid starting with the base model, which is an ES. Then you can also get an SE. There's an SE technology along with an SEL, SEL Touring, SEL Premium, and then the SEL Platinum Edition. And then for the plug-in hybrid version, you do have some very similar trim levels, ES, SE, SE Tech, SEL, SEL Touring, Premium, and the Platinum Edition. Now the model behind me is the SEL, so this has two trim levels that are still above it in pricing. We'll go over that here in just a second. So just depending on your budget, which we'll also talk about, you have a lot to choose from for this model. So let's talk about what powers the Mitsubishi Outlander. There are two different engine options. For the base engine, you are looking at a two and a half liter inline four cylinder with 131 horsepower, 144 pound-feet of torque. Now, honestly, I feel like that might be a little bit underpowered, especially since I've been driving around this plug-in hybrid version. So if you want the plug-in hybrid, you can get a 2.4 liter inline four cylinder with two electric motors and a 20 kilowatt lithium ion battery pack that increases power to 248, 332 pound-feet of torque. So significantly more, but again, that's just going to depend on your budget, what you're looking to do, and the power that you're looking to get out of your vehicle. And both of these are paired to only one transmission. That is the single speed CVT. So let's move on to the pricing now for the Mitsubishi Outlander. If you go with a base engine along with the entry level trim level, you are looking right around $28,000. And that can climb all the way to the mid to high $50,000 range if you go with the plug-in hybrid and one of those higher trim levels. For reference, the SEL behind me, which is the plug-in hybrid, is right at $51,000. So this trim level is pretty much fully loaded. However, like I mentioned earlier, there are two more above this plug-in SEL. So again, just depending on your budget, what you're looking to go for. Now on the used market for the Mitsubishi Outlander, if you look at earlier model, models, so closer to the first and second generations, I have found them with 48,000 to 180,000 miles for about four to $8,000. For 22 year models, you're looking between 22,000 and 28,000. So it looks like there is a pretty big price depreciation for these models. And not to discourage you from buying a brand new one, I'm not sure what different dealer incentives are or anything like that, any discounts or warranties that are included with new versus used. So be sure to do some research on that if you're looking for a new one versus looking for a used one. Now, like I said, the fourth generation came out in 2022. So you can look for a good used 2022, 2023, save a little bit of money, but there are people who do enjoy getting a brand new vehicle that no one else has been in, and you can just say that you have got a brand new vehicle. So those are some things to look out for as far as the pricing goes. It does look like they do depreciate. You can always find a really good used one. However, with the used one, here are some things that you need to look out for. And so a lot of the information that I'm going to go over is specific to the Mitsubishi Outlander, but you can use some of this as general information looking at other brands, of course. So we'll start off with any recalls or issues, and we'll start off with the premature brake wear. 
Now what this means is that the factory pads on this vehicle tend to wear out much quicker than other brands or other manufacturers. A lot of that can contribute to your driving habits if you're slamming on the brakes consistently, if you're in stop and go traffic, factors like that can attribute to it. However, with the premature brake wear, it's really something that would be insignificant to fix. Getting new brake pads doesn't really cost all that much, especially if you can do it yourself. If you can't, I don't think labor for that would really cost that much. It's a pretty easy and relatively affordable thing to fix. And especially if you go with a different brand, you can extend the life of those brake pads. And so that's not something that really is a major issue, at least in my eyes, that's something that you can easily fix and upgrade with new pads. And the next item on this list is the failed blower motor. Now this, it pertains to the AC. That's something that shouldn't really cost all that much. I haven't really seen anything as far as on the forums actually seeing this fail a lot. It was just something that was considered. Transmission fluid needs to be replaced on these between 30,000 and 60,000 miles, which is something that is kind of general maintenance. When you change your oil once a year or every 10,000 miles, transmission fluid is something that does have to be changed out as well. So that's just regular maintenance. I feel like there's some other models that can go longer than that and it can depend on the type of oil that you use, but 30 to 60,000 miles seems kind of in the norm to me. A whining sound or decelerating quickly. I haven't noticed anything driving this for the last seven days, but that was something that I found on forums that was kind of a concern. Just hearing a whining noise, maybe under acceleration, or the vehicle decelerates at a quick rate of speed. Uh, recalls that I have found for the fourth generation, the backup camera and the fuel system. Now on the backup camera, I think it was just a glitch or some kind of software update that they had to uh, update, of course. And the fuel system, I really couldn't find anything. I think it was maybe just an error code. I know it's a fuel system, that's something that is important, but it didn't really seem anything too out of the ordinary. Now I did find there were some years to avoid for the Outlander in general, between 2014 and 2018, which would be the third generation for the Outlander itself. The only thing that I found with those years to avoid was paint issues or chipping. So maybe it just depends on the region that you live in, what you're driving in, you know, a lot of rain or kind of harsher weather, anything like that. Uh, so that could just be based on whoever has the car and where you are. I know I owned a, a third generation Toyota Tacoma and a lot of people had concerns with paint chipping, but I never had any. I had zero on mine. It could also be the color of the vehicle that you buy. For my Tacoma, white seemed to be the most common vehicle that had issues with paint chipping. I owned a blue Tacoma and I had zero issues. So if you're looking into this, maybe just look to see if there's some other colors that are more prone to it or not. Maybe just the type of paint, the, the way that the paint was on the car, something like that. It's just something that I did find. And along with everything that I just said, and I kind of hinted at this before, make sure you get a pre-purchase inspection. So this is something that can help you in determining some of those issues and being able to make sure that you have a sound car before you actually buy it and take it off the lot. And then along with everything that I just went over, I did find that JD Power put Mitsubishi in the top 10 for 2023 and specifically the Outlander. So maybe the 2023 model is the one to go with because it was in the top 10. So interesting to see that there are some issues. However, with those issues, it still puts it at a pretty reliable vehicle to own. And for this next topic, I have never personally owned a Mitsubishi Outlander. So a lot of this is doing research, finding some of these numbers, some averages that I can share with you just to give you a general idea. So we'll start off with the cost of maintenance. And of course, that is going to depend on what part you need. If you're getting oil changes, things like that, the shops that you go to, the labor that they are going to charge, or if you can do this yourself and save a little bit of money. What I found on average, it's going to cost between $500 and $800 a year in order to maintain this Outlander. Now, personally, I think that is extremely high. I own an Audi R8 and it doesn't even cost but a couple hundred dollars a year to maintain that. So for this type of vehicle here, I really don't see that happening. But again, it could just depend on if you need to get something replaced. Dealerships are going to charge a lot more, so an oil change for this could be roughly half of that just getting one oil change done. So again, do your research on just different shops, labor quotes, things like that. It really shouldn't cost all that much to keep this on the road. 
Now that doesn't include insurance, registration, other fees like that. And of course that's going to depend on not only on your driving history, but the region that you live in and what you have to pay annually to also keep this on the road. Now, as far as insurance goes, I found on average it can cost as low as $138 a month. But again, there's so many factors in that I can't really give you a concrete answer because that is going to be different for everyone, including being different ages, things like that. So there's a lot that goes into that. And then you can also factor in a warranty. Now I don't have any numbers on warranties because that is going to vary. If you buy a brand new vehicle, of course you can get a warranty included in that. Or if you buy a pre-owned vehicle, you can also buy extended warranties to help just give you a little bit better peace of mind. So there's a lot of factors there. That's just something that each person has to do their own research on depending on the dealer that you're at, the warranties that are available, and what is going to be most cost effective. And so before we get this out on the road, now let's just talk about real quick what this specific model is so this is the plug-in hybrid sel msrp is fifty one thousand dollars really the only options for this we have the sel premium package which is twenty seven hundred dollars along with the cover in the back and then the welcome package it gives you a few minor things here for an insignificant cost there. But everything else is standard for this exact model here. And we have a very nice exterior color, which is the uh, red diamond with the black roof. So it has the really cool two-tone design to it. For the interior, I'm also very impressed with this. We have the two-tone, a lot of diamond stitching, very nice seats, which are massaging. And then taking a look at the steering wheel, it's perforated. We have a lot of controls to go over as well. I think it's a very, very nice layout. Now you'll notice too, if you haven't already noticed, we have a lot of Nissan technology. So the entire gauge cluster is borrowed from Nissan as well as the infotainment system and all of these controls. I'm not exactly sure their partnership with that, but it does give it a really nice interior. We have a lot of controls on this left side here. Like I said, I've done a full review for this. So if you wanna see all these specs in greater details, definitely take a look at that separate video. We have tons of driving modes as well, even wireless charging too. We have the full sunroof, Bose audio. It's a very nicely equipped, compact SUV. Now in the back, you have plenty of space. You even get a heated second row, which is awesome to see. And then in back, this is what makes it interesting. So we have the power lift gate, and I currently have the third row folded down. Now with this cover installed, it's it's not uh, you're not able to flip it up all the way, but you can kind of get the idea of it, locking it into place and the storage that you get behind it. It is compact. There's only two seats back there and it's really for smaller kids in a pinch if you really need to access them. But as far as the exterior styling goes, I think this is very sharp, especially in this red. I've seen a ton of these out on the road since I've had this over the last seven days. All of them have been different colors. I think the red and the black definitely gives this a great look. So now that we're behind the wheel, there's a few things that I wanna go over with how this has been over the last seven days. Nothing really too concerning about this. I'm going to start off with the auto hold, something very minor and insignificant. The auto hold is there so that way you don't have to uh, keep your foot on the brake when you're at a stop. It does default to shutting off every time. So when you get back into the vehicle, you do have to push on that if you wanna use it. And it's something that I think is nice to have. I think it should stay in whichever setting you have. So every time you get in, you gotta push on that in order for that to occur. And then the other thing is, every time you start this up, it will default to EV. So it will start in the EV setting and you will be driving an EV until you decide to change that mode. So it doesn't default to the last mode that you are in. A lot of EVs do that, so it's not too out of the norm, uh, but I do catch myself having to change it to charge or save the EV system. Now, one thing that I also wanted to talk about was with the EV system, this is very impressive. The range on this, I'm down to 23 miles, but I started at 65 and that wasn't even fully charged for just the EV system. So you could drive this for several days, depending on where you're going, on strictly just the EV. So the range on this is right around 500 miles or so. 
combined with the gas and the EV. Very, very impressive uh, considering a lot of EVs today only have a range, or a hybrid I'll say, a hybrid with the EV system only has a range of maybe 30 to 50 miles or so. So I gotta say Mitsubishi is stepping up their game with the hybrids as far as how far you can go on just the EV system alone. Now, aside from that, everything else has been nice. It's a super comfortable vehicle to drive, something that has kind of a, a luxury feel to it from a brand that's not really as luxurious as some other brands. So from a Mitsubishi, we have some Nissan components in here, but we also have some nice materials with all the leather, a little bit of plastic on the dash, as well as up top there, but I mean, it's, it's a very nice interior. Now, obviously I'm not in a base level, so the materials are going to be different, but that is going to wrap it up for the buyer's guide on the all new Mitsubishi Outlander, as well as some of the other generations too. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Comment down below if this is a vehicle that you are looking at. What brought you to uh, wanting to buy this vehicle? What intrigued you, the looks, the tech, maybe the pricing? the engine options. Let me know what uh, makes you interested in this vehicle in general, and I hope this was helpful for you in that process. If you enjoyed today's video, give it a huge thumbs up and consider smashing that subscribe button so you don't miss out on our daily uploads. I will see you all in the next video.